Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this program this evening. Uh, my name is Bill Graben, uh, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of York County Audubon, we're delighted to have you here tonight. We took a couple of months off, a little summer hiatus to our Zoom programs, uh, but we're back now for our, fo our fall season. Uh, we will be having a Zoom program in October, but we don't quite have the details finalized yet. So I can't provide them this evening, uh, but they will be available shortly on our uh, website and Facebook page. Uh, so please keep an eye out for them. Uh, and if you're on our email list, you'll be getting an email in early October as well. So keep an eye out for that. And one other, one other chapter note is that uh, we will also shortly be making available uh, the 2022 uh, the 2022 Maine Audubon, excuse me, got interrupted by something here. Uh, the 2022 uh, Maine Birds calendar, a desktop calendar that our former board member, Marie Jordan, uh, a well-known birder and photographer has been putting together for many years for us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it as a fundraiser for York County Audubon. So details of that will be available on our website and Facebook page soon. Um, <clears throat> tonight, uh, we're delighted to have with us the ornithology ranger from Acadia National Park, Patrick Kark who will be talking to us about peregrine falcons. Uh, as you know, uh, peregrines were listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act in the early 70s and what are, were have been a wonderful success story. Uh, and Acadia played a key role in that success. Um, so we're interested very much to hear about that. And, uh, Patrick will also be telling us about the Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch. So again, uh, a lot to talk about. At the end of the program, we will be having a Q&A session. So if at any time during the program, you have a question you might like some more information on, please hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it in, and we'll do our best to get some answers at the end of the program. And one final note, our monthly refrain is, please keep your cats indoors. I know that uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but please be encouraged to uh, be aware of friends, neighbors, community members who might not be aware of the consequence of their cats activities. It can make a huge difference. Uh, so thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, now I'm happy to turn it over to Patrick. Thanks so much, Bill. And I am grateful for York County Audubon to, for reaching out to Acadia National Park and myself to be able to uh, give you all this presentation today. Um, talking about the raptor conservation after here, efforts here at Acadia National Park is one of my favorite things to do. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing all of you, with all of you about, um, you know, the success of the peregrine falcon recovery here in Acadia, but then also our, our more current uh, program that is still part of raptor conservation, and that is our Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch. I'm going to pop up my presentation real quick. Let's uh, want to make sure that's coming in nicely. Yep, your uh, screen share and audio look great. Perfect. All right. Okay, so let's get started. So first off, um, just to let you all know a little bit about myself, uh, I was born and raised in Colorado, and I was lucky enough to uh, go to Colorado State University where I studied zoology and Actually, if some of you were here early enough, studying during that time in college was where I fell in love with birds. Um, it, my spark bird was an American white pelican. Uh, 
I wouldn't say I have any strong feelings towards the Pelicans anymore uh, because Raptors uh, really quickly stole my heart once I was lucky enough to came, come out to Acadia as an intern in the summer of 2014. Uh, I was, uh, I came out here as a Raptor intern, which is the coolest job title I'll ever have in my life. Um, and during that internship is where I truly fell in love with Peregrine Falcons, Raptors in general, but more importantly, telling this conservation story um, that was so successful in the park. I was lucky enough that that internship turned into a position here at Acadia, where I was able to be uh, the, an ornithology ranger here uh, ever since. And it has truly been um, one of the best things of my life. Um, moving out here to Maine, being able to be working in such a beautiful location. And I was lucky enough to meet my wife out here as well. Um, and so uh, Maine's truly been a special place for me. Well, we're not here to talk about me tonight. We are here to talk about peregrine falcons. And I love this picture here. This is one of the earliest, uh, earliest pictures of peregrine falcons that we have in Acadia National Park from their return. And so it's pretty special. Uh, but to really talk about the conservation program that happened here at Acadia National Park, I do want to go over what Bill mentioned uh, briefly at the beginning of this program was that, and that was the decline of peregrine falcons and most raptor species throughout uh, the 1940s, 50s, and 60s throughout uh, North America. And for most people, they are aware that that happened because of a chemical that was being sprayed called DDT. And, uh, and although DDT was developed uh, during World War II and it turned out to be an amazing insecticide. Um, you could spray your fields with it, treat your fields with it, and it was excellent at killing off a variety of different pest species that uh, impacted crops. But what was unforeseen was the cascading effects that spraying, mass spraying the, this chemical um, would have. Uh, my father tells me stories of when he was growing up that they would run behind the DDT trucks as they came through town because it smelled really good to them. And it probably explains a lot about my father today. But because of this widespread spraying, DDT ended up in, uh, in the environment. And the thing about DDT is once it breaks down into a, another chemical compound called DDE, it actually sticks. It stays around and it has a very, very difficult time breaking down in the natural environment. Well, this DDE was sitting on the crops well, over time, insects, small rodents, anything else in those crops started to accumulate DDT in their bodies. Well, then predators, like other birds, eating those insects, eating those rodents, started to get that DDE in their bodies, so on and so forth, cascading up the food chain to the top of it where birds, like peregrine falcons, started to suck. But one of the driving factors for why the decline of these raptor species was so um, drastic or unforeseen during the 50s and the 60s was the fact that this DDE accumulation did not kill adult birds. It wasn't like arsenic or some sort of poison that got in these birds and all of a sudden you saw birds dead on the side of the road. But what it did do was get into those breeding female falcons. And what DDE did was it inhibited calcium uptake in the birds. So when they would go to lay eggs during the breeding season, they could not form a complete calcium egg shell. And this, what, this is what made their eggs really soft, almost like gummy to the touch to the point where 
although these birds, these peregrine falcons were doing everything right, when the adults would go to incubate the eggs, even the weight of a one pound falcon was crushing the eggs beneath them. And so for two decades, recruitment into the population was almost nothing. But, and luckily, because of that, you know, impact, eventually people, were well, not luckily, luckily people started noticing it. Eventually, the adult birds started to disappear from the landscape as well. And then there's a remarkable woman named Rachel Carson who wrote a remarkable book called Silent Spring. And I am a huge fan of Silent Spring because in my opinion, it is one of the first forms of scientific communication. Rachel Carson took research, DDE was causing thin eggshells in birds that researchers had figured out in the 50s. But during the publication of her book, that information finally became available to the public. And that was extremely powerful in this conservation story because through the public, pressure increased to the point where in 1972, DDT was banned for use in the United States. And slowly but surely, uh, Canada as well as Mexico followed suit in banning that chemical. And this, was super, super important at the beginning of the recovery of these birds. In 1970, a survey throughout the country showed that peregrine falcon numbers had completely declined throughout North America to the point where, as you can see, very few pairs were seen in what we would consider untouched places such as Southern Canada, Alaska, and in the west coast of Canada. But more importantly, east of the Mississippi River, you could not find a single peregrine falcon breeding pair. Um, there was a subspecies of peregrine falcon called Falco peregrinus anatum. Uh, uh, what separated from other peregrine falcons would actually had little larger feet. And unfortunately, during this time, wild um, anatom peregrines were extirpated, which means gone from a location. But because of Silent Spring, because the public was influenced to ban the use of these chemicals, but also beginning to support wildlife conservation efforts here in the United States. The Endangered Species Act is passed. And with that, one of the first animals on it was the peregrine falcon. And with these efforts of the Endangered Species Act, peregrine falcon recovery started to occur in the United States. When we talk about raptors, uh, raptor conservation, you'll also hear a term usually called hacking. <clears throat> and no, these birds aren't amazing at um, getting into your personal information. What hacking means when we're talking about birds is raising birds in captivity. And what we would do is we would, well, what, what these Agencies did, be it federal, nonprofit, they worked together with state agencies and also a key stakeholder that was critical to the recovery of peregrine falcons were falconers, because falconers were the only people in the country with experience <coughs> raising peregrine falcons in captivity. And so Working all together, they developed these hacking programs where they would raise these young peregrine falcons in captivity. You can see that the creepy puppets were involved, but these creepy puppets had a important, app, an important part of this program. 
And that is birds have a unique way of figuring out what they are. And they, and we often see videos on YouTube or Facebook of ducklings following a dog or little chicks following a human being around. And that's because during a critical time in development, just a, about a week and a half or so after hatching, birds go through what's called imprinting. And what that means is what they see is what they think they are going to be and what they are going to try and associate with the rest of their lives. And so it's important for these young peregrine falcons to see the markings, the colorations that told them that they were peregrine falcons. So when they were released, they would be able to identify, hey, that's another peregrine falcon. That's who I should be hanging out with. <clears throat> And although peregrine falcon recovery did begin just after the Endangered Species Act passing in 1972, here in New England, there was roughly a slow start. And one of the reasons for that was peregrine falcons weren't, hadn't, weren't or hadn't been heavily studied in the area. Specifically, where were some of their potential places that we could bring these falcons back to because they lived there in the past? Well, this question was finally asked by an Acadia National Park Resource Management Specialist named Carol Shell and a professor named William Drury, who was at the College of the Atlantic, which is a college here on Mount Desert Island. And together they did a survey of historic area locations on Mount Desert Island in 1983. And I used a fancy term there, uh, airy or eyrie, that is just uh, pretty much today what we would call a cliff nesting site or the nesting area of a bird on a cliff. But with the information that they found of these historic airy sites, they identified two. And those on my, the picture here are the yellow dots. One was the precipice cliffs there on the eastern side of the island, and the other was Valley Cove over in Somme Sound, which is the body of water that almost cuts Mount Desert Island in half. Well, with those two locations <clears throat> being the primary places they found, they decided to pick a spot right in the pretty much the dead center of those two locations called Jordan Cliffs above Jordan Pond to be the place where Acadia National Park would try to bring falcons back to the New England region. And that project began the next year in 1984. Park staff, falconers, and other uh, members of the state, uh, Fish and Wildlife Services, worked together to hack peregrine falcons on the cliffs, of, uh, cliffs above Jordan Pond. We hacked birds there. We hacked 22 peregrine falcon fledglings from those cliffs over a three-year period, 1984, 85, and 86. The order was in. There were falcon chicks coming to the park in 1987, but one week before those birds were to be put up on the cliff face, we saw an immature peregrine falcon hanging around the Jordan Cliff sites. That peregrine falcon happened to be one of the males from 1986 named Ganesh. But with the presence of that sub-adult falcon, and peregrine falcons reach maturity at the age of two, so Ganesh was one, they're very territorial. They're not going to help young ones survive. They would have seen them as a competition. And so therefore, with the presence of that sub-adult falcon, they shipped off those peregrine falcon chicks to another location in the state to be released. In 1988, after, well, after the summer goes in 1987, Ganesh is seen again in Acadia National Park at the cliffs of the, cliffs of the precipice. <clears throat> Unfortunately, and during that time, we see Ganesh 
with a subadult female. So just like him the year prior, she's too young to breed. We see them interacting, but no dice. There is no way they could have been a successful breeding pair. <clears throat> the summer goes by. In 1989, Ganesh returns again to the cliffs of the precipice. This time with a mature female showing up. However, we never see any nesting behavior begin. The summer goes on, the birds leave. In 1990, Ganesh returns again. He, they do see Ganesh, an adult female, go through courtship activities. And in Peregrine Falcons, that is, um, males bringing and doing food exchanges with the females. And then the female following the male to different locations on the cliff where he is showing her the different potential nesting sites along the cliff. <clears throat> However, in late April, a storm comes in and makes the nesting fail. But, in 1991, Ganesh returns again, this time with another female falcon. <coughs> uh, we do not know if it was the same one or not from 1990. And together, they raised the first three wild peregrine falcon chicks in Acadia National Park since 1956. Remarkable. This is what this whole program is trying to be releasing these birds in locations, trying to bring them back here to successfully breed. I love showing this picture here. This picture is taken from just below the nest site. And so the peregrine falcons have a beautiful view of sunrise every morning. Um, important, almost Always in the wild, you'll find peregrine falcons nesting on the eastern side of cliff faces, or at least northeast or southeast, because they require the morning sun to help heat up their nest sites, but also create thermals on the side of buildings, cliff faces, bridges, that give them that hot air that rises up in the morning and gives them free elevator lifts all up and down and around the cliff face allowing them to hunt and do all the activity they need to do with the minimal energy expenditure. And what makes the precipice so special is how successful it has been since 1991. It, as one site, has produced 80 peregrine falcon fledglings. Um, and that is updated as of 2021. We did have two peregrine falcon fledgings there this year. And that is super important that each year this site was so successful. You can see there in 91 through 97, three, three, four, four, three. The average peregrine falcon nest site was two. And so just through one peregrine falcon nesting here in the one pair nesting here in the park early on, they are almost having roughly two successful clutches each year, which was incredible. And that's really important because peregrine, being a peregrine falcon is difficult. And roughly the success rate of a peregrine falcon fledgling making it to adulthood to breed is about roughly 25%. And so when the pairs had the, the four chicks in 93 and 94, the statistics say pretty much we almost guaranteed an adult falcon making it to breeding age uh, each time that happened, which was so critical to bringing these peregrine falcons back. And probably one of my favorite parts of the pair, why the precipice cliff is so special is because of how accessible it is for people to come and visit. Every May through the end of July, early August, during the peregrine falcon breeding season, Acadia National Park has hosted interns and rangers there to help visitors see these wonderful birds up on those cliffs. The program started in 1991. 
I unfortunately don't have the data for it, but since 1998, the Peregrine Falcon Watch Program has helped over 400,000 visitors see Peregrine Falcons, talk about Peregrine Falcons, and most importantly, talk about the success of the Peregrine Falcon conservation story here in Acadia National Park, but also throughout North America. The success of the precipice led to Acadia National Park gaining <clears throat> three more nesting sites in the coming years. Those are <clears throat> on the top right, you can see Jordan Cliffs, Jordan Pond, where the original hacking was. We do have wild birds nesting there each year now. We have Valley Cove, which is the bottom left picture, uh, which is also another successful nesting site year in and year out. And then on the bottom right, we see Echo Cliffs or the Canada Cliffs by Echo Beach. This site is off and on. Uh, here in Acadia National Park, often during the programs, we get asked, well, you know, how far apart do these birds need to breed? Why can't you have 20 pairs on one cliff? Again, they're very territorial. And here in the park, it roughly seems that their, their territories have to be a mile apart. And so as a peregrine flies, Valley Cove and Echo Cliffs are too close together. Um, so only once in the history of peregrines here have we seen a pair nest at both occasions in the same year. Usually it's one or the other. Uh, my theory these days is that most of the time the birds will attempt to nest on Valley Cove and if the first laying fails, they will sometimes retreat a little farther inland and try to nest here on Echo Cliffs. Another reason that might be impacting things. If you look at the picture there, you can see that Echo Cliffs does have a lot of vegetation on the cliff face. And the birds used to nest in an old raven's nest on that cliff. And now vegetation is growing up into that area, which is maybe causing it to not be as successful as a nesting location. But through all of these nesting sites, Acadia National Park has produced 166 peregrine falcon fledglings as of this year, which is incredible. And it makes it one of the most successful peregrine falcon nesting sites in the entire country. And its success and Acadia National Park's success as of having successful birds each year is one of the reasons why um, peregrine falcons have recovered so well here in New England. I always do want to point out uh, what's really fun about our peregrine falcons here in Acadia is that I've never seen a single one of them eat a pigeon. Uh, although so many of us now are see peregrine falcons as pigeon eaters in cities and because a skyscraper is a perfect artificial cliff. Um, but what's really fun about the birds here is in a year, you can see kind of the personalities or the diet preferences of those pairs of birds. Sometimes it's gulls, sometimes it's some small seabirds like these black guillemots, um, and sometimes it's woodpeckers. But often our precipice pair can be seen at Egg Rock Island, which is over two miles away from their uh, nesting site hunting uh, mostly goals out there. But then also our peregrine falcon pair has also been seen at Petit Manon Island, um, trying to feed on nesting terns, guillemots, puffins, uh, you name it, all those uh, colonial nesting seabirds out on those small islands, which is over 10 miles away from the nesting site. So truly remarkable how far these birds might go to get a meal. So we, we mentioned about, you know, 166 peregrine falcon fledglings being super, super important to the recovery of birds. Well, where have some of our birds ended up? One of the most famous of our birds was in 1994. Uh, one of the females born that year became the peregrine falcon 
that started nesting on the Christian Science build, Building in Boston in 96 and 97. And then what's even more impressive is that she was later found dead in 2011 in Boston, making her 17 years old, which is absolutely breathtaking that a wild falcon made it to that when you're, you know, the average is usually between six and 10. But many of our birds have gone on to nest in New Hampshire, Maryland, uh, Washington, D.C., Vermont, New Brunswick, other locations in Maine. Um, but I do want to point out right there in the center there in 1997, one of our males was found in Cuba in January. That means from the time that falcon left Acadia National Park probably sometime in August or September in, in four or five months, <clears throat> or six months or so, that bird ended up in Cuba. And that really just um, gives credence to the name of the peregrine falcon, which is comes from the Latin word peregrinus, which means wanderer. Well, how do we know where some of our birds end up? Here at Acadia National Park, we still run an active banding program. Each year we do try and band our peregrine falcon fledglings. We partner with a local climbing school and use their experts to work with wildlife biologists to go up to the nest sites and send the little birds on adventurous trips in bags up to the top where um, park rangers take measurements, do visual checks for lice and health, other health risks and then return them to their nesting sites with their brand new jewelry. Um, each one of our birds gets two pieces of jewelry. Uh, on the left leg here in this picture, you can see a small silver band. That is the federal band uh, given out by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is the band that pretty much is your, um, if you find these birds dead, that's the band you end up usually reporting uh, because it's really tough to see when a bird's flying around or standing or anything like that. It just doesn't jump out. But to help us ID birds in the field that are living, there's also the state band. Um, and for the state of Maine, we're black over green, which we can see on the right leg of this peregrine falcon fledgling. And so this peregrine falcon is W95. And so in two, three, four, five years. If you happen to be visiting someplace and you see a falcon and you're able to pick out its band and it's W95, you know that it came from Acadia, but if you at least see black over green, then you know that bird was born in the state of Maine. And so throughout these efforts, we have recovered peregrine falcons. I mean, they have been now off the endangered species list since 1999. And today you can see peregrine falcons all across North America, all across the world. Um, one thing that was really helpful for birds for peregrine falcon recovery is we didn't realize how good cities would be at supporting their populations. So places like New York, actually through some of their major cities, hold more peregrine falcons in them now than they probably ever did in the past. And so bringing back peregrine falcons is probably one of the greatest conservation stories that we have here in the United States. I mean, it's the gold standard to hold all other conservation efforts up to. But there was also another learning opportunity. And that learning opportunity is we never wanted what happened to these birds to happen again. How did we go from seeing adults year after year to nothing? And through that is where, or and through that drive, through that wanting to monitor these bird species is where hawk watches were born from. And ours here in the park is called Cadillac Hawk Watch. 
and it is a partnership between the Scudic Institute and the National Park Service. But hawk watches didn't begin here in Acadia. Hawk watches began on Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania with the hawk. Um, there at Hawk Mountain, named Hawk Mountain, uh, because they used to go to the top of it and shoot birds during migration because it was so easy to do. Um, but today is a remarkable education site and a remarkable place to visit if you want to see migrating birds. But the idea of monitoring these populations through these hawk watch sites in the fall has spread throughout North America to the point where now there's over 100 sites from Canada all the way down to Veracruz, Mexico. And almost all those sites are part of the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And one of those sites is the Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch. Well, why do we watch hawks on Cadillac? And that is because we are actually the second, we are, there's only, we are the second farthest north hawk watch site in the country. And we're actually the only one this far north in New England. The only other site farther north than us is in Greenlaw, New Brunswick. But what makes us so special is we are sitting on top of a 1,530 foot mountain right in the middle of the Atlantic Flyway. So as these birds start to migrate south from Nova Scotia, Canadian Maritimes, New Brunswick, they start to follow along the coastline and boom, they run into Cadillac Mountain. And from there, we count these birds and in weeks, if not days, they'll be working their way down the entire Atlantic coast, down the Appalachian Mountains, and on their way around the Gulf of Mexico. And for many of these species, they're headed all the way down to Central and South America. <clears throat> well, here at Cadillac, we have the opportunity to count 13 species each year. Those starting from the top left, moving to the bottom right, we have turkey vultures, bald eagles, osprey, Northern Harriers, middle left, there's a Cooper's Hawk. <clears throat> the one next to it is a sharp chinned Hawk, American Kestrel and a Merlin, those are Falcons. The bottom left, we have Broadwing Hawk, Red Tail Hawks, Northern Goss Hawks, and then last but not least there, the Peregrine Falcon. Here at Cadillac, we've been doing this Hawk Watch for 27 years starting in 1995. And just to pull out a few of the data points here for you, uh, the birds that we see the most of are sharp shinned hawks, American kestrels and broadwing hawks. We can see that at about um, 1,000 sharp shinned hawks, 600 American kestrels and 600 broadwing hawks each year. And we average roughly uh, 28,000, 2,800 birds each year at our Hawk Watch site. The reason why we don't see 50,000 or 100,000 like some of the other sites farther south is because we are so far north. We're barely seeing a subsection of the populations of these birds working their way during this migration. But we talked about Hawk Watch's being brought up to be these monitoring programs. And so through all hundreds of these sites, together their data is brought together and this allows us to do population trends and view those trends throughout North America to see how these populations are doing. And I love this little data section here because we can see the return of bald eagles and peregrine falcons here in New England, um, specifically the bald eagle one is super dramatic, starting with zero for the first couple of years. And now we pretty much see over a hundred on migration each and every year. We also have about 13 nesting bald eagles in and around the park. And so this is a wonderful place to see them, uh, but even more so the data shows that our conservation efforts on these raptors has been so successful. 
I did want to give people a little sneak peek of the data that has been collected this year so far. Um, so as you can see, we've seen just over a thousand birds. This was last updated uh, September 18th. Our weekend data hasn't been submitted yet. Uh, but as you can see, uh, broadwing hawks are leading the count so far, followed by sharpshins and then American kestrels. Uh, broadwing hawks do tend to move earlier in bigger numbers than most of the other birds. Um, and so we expect to see those sharpshin, hummer, sharpshin and a kestrel numbers increase and surpass broadwing hawks any day now. Uh, specifically, I was actually up on the mountain on Sunday and we had at least 80 American kestrels go by uh, before I left and another 60 or 70 sharp chinned hawks. Um, so it really, um, really is an amazing place to see those birds in particular. But truly what makes Cadillac Mountain special, in my opinion, is the fact that it is one of the greatest places to view migrating raptors. Although we don't see thousands of these birds in a day, like some other locations, we do get some of the best views. And I'm not just talking about the view from the mountain because I dare you to find another hawk watch with as pretty as a view as we get on top of that mountain, even on the bad days. But because we are this granite tower sticking out of the ground that these birds haven't seen anything that tall they pass over our heads within hundreds of feet always. And I've been lucky enough, I've seen all 13 of those species pass within 30 feet of my head at some point or another. And that was a lot of fun, especially when I was an intern because not often do you have to bring out your raptor ID book and learn how to ID raptors from the top. Um, but you do when you're, here at Acadia National Park, because so often we see them coming in below us before they pass right over our heads. Uh, here's a beautiful look of a broadwing hawk passing right in front of our faces at about 80 feet. An osprey going over, northern harrier, sharpshin hawks, American kestrel, and of course, a beautiful view each and every day. And so as I'm wrapping up this presentation, I would love to invite all of you who are attending and your friends that if you want and you're looking for something to do on a weekend or you have the time off, come and visit us at the Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch this fall or in future years when you can, because it truly is a remarkable group of people and volunteers up there that make this Hawk Watch possible. It's a wonderful opportunity to sit and learn these birds. And it's also just a wonderful group of people to hang out with for a couple hours each day and see these remarkable animals take on one of the greatest feats in nature, migration on their way south each and every year. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining me tonight. And hopefully you learned a little bit about the Peregrine Falcon Conservation and Hawk watch work that we do here at the park. If you have any questions um, that don't get answered tonight or come up tomorrow or the next day, feel free to reach out to my email and I will do my best to get back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. That was great. Uh, I have a few questions here and uh, I'd like just to remind people again, feel free to type any question using the Q&A button. Uh, one nice feature of hawk watch, hawk watches and hawk watching that maybe you can elaborate on a bit is that many people uh, think of birding as having to occur at crack of dawn. And that is not the case with hawk watches as uh, they wait for thermals and et cetera to build up during the day. So what are the best hours for uh, for, for participating in the hawk watch there. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point to bring up. And uh, you're, you're dead on. Hawk watching is for the people who don't have to be as early as the birds. Um, the best time to be hawk watching on a given day is probably 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and 
that is, as Bill mentioned, because that's when the thermals are happening. You know, um, it doesn't start too early in the morning because the sun hasn't had enough time to heat up the granite or asphalt or you name surface to produce those that rising heat that these birds are using as um, pretty much hopscotching on hot air during the day. Um, but then we don't even have to stay up there all day because by you know 2 p.m. or so the sun's now heated up everything. Yep. And so again those thermals die down and you can leave off. Uh, one thing I didn't mention as well uh, for fall hawk watching especially here at Cadillac. If it's a south wind and you're here, go on a beautiful hike. <laughs> Don't need to necessarily come up to the hot watch. Uh, south winds shut everything down. But if the winds are coming out of north, those are the times to be up there on top of that mountain. Yeah, and, and on a good day, how late are the, how late in the day are hawk watchers uh, keeping an eye out? On, on, like those premier days, which are happening about right now, around mid-September, uh, when we have the perfect conditions, our, our volunteer counters are often out there till, you know, 3, 4 p.m. or so. Um, maybe if they brought dinner, they'll stick it around until 5. But. Yeah. And our, I just got a question. Our, does any hawk, what hawk watching, if any, occurs in the spring? Yeah, um, there are a handful of hawk watches that do occur in spring. Uh, Maine actually has a great one on Bradbury Mountain. Okay. Uh, that is a pretty nice spring hawk watch. In, um, in Pownall? Yeah, yep. And the, the reason why you don't see as many is because they're dispersing now instead of funneling, you know, in yep. fall. You're having everything coming together into one spot while in the spring they're kind of spreading out so you don't see the same amount of numbers and then also in the fall that occurs when all the young have been born and fledged so it gives you a better idea of what the healthy breeding numbers are going on as they're working their way south but uh bradbury mountain is an excellent place to go do spring hawk watching as well so you you're not relegated in the fall about half the year you can get some good hawk watching yeah, and uh, I've read accounts just recently uh, that this is a record-breaking year for uh, visitors to the park. Uh, how has that affected your work and, and the Hawk Watch, if at all? And Yeah, I mean, um, this year we're probably going to break 4 million visitors for the first time in the park's history, um, which is awesome um too um depending on who you ask awesome that people are getting out and experiencing uh acadia national park and outdoor spaces because it's not just acadia it's you know every outdoor space from county parks on up um people are just getting outside which is really special um luckily for the peregrine falcon watch and the hawk watch roughly it's just more people to run into and talk to um it's what's really nice about our hawk watch is we're actually 200 yards down the North Ridge Trail of Cadillac Mountain. So we're not up there in the, the parking lot with uh, all those people mingling around. You know, we're catching some people hiking the trail or the people who are wanting to walk down to us. So it really keeps it pretty uh, intimate and small um, and really a great place just to hang out with other hawk watchers. Are you... Uh, is your are your how are your staffing levels there? Are you are your resources really being strained by the influx of visitors? Um, simply put, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is there anything people can do to assist with that? Is it uh, Friends of Acadia or? Yeah, uh, Friends of Acadia is a great organization. That's our official friends group that helps the park in so many ways. Uh, for many of you who, you know, recreated in the park, you know, we wouldn't really be able to upkeep the carriage roads the best, you know, to the point that we can having them as like a premier carriage road system without the help of Friends of Acadia and so much more. They provide, you know, resource technicians and education interns and a variety of other staffing help that helps the park run on a year to year basis. Um, 
but other options are, um, of course, always talking to um, your representatives uh, in the state and federal government, because in the end, so much for what happens in national parks is driven through uh, legislation. And so um, always doing your best to reach out to support places like Acadia is always appreciated. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure to, to have this insight into what's going on there. Uh, I got one last question here. Uh, is there an opportunity for people to volunteer at the Hawk Watch? Yeah, there, um, there is. Um, we have volunteers come out, or we have a bunch of volunteers that come about an hour and a half away or so to the island mm -hmm. each day on the good days. We're always looking for uh, more data, you know, like if you can commit to a day coverage, um, then, you know, coming up, you know, every so often, but um, Seth Benz of the Scudic Institute is actually the one you would want to contact uh, yep. to um, reach out and see if you could do any volunteer opportunities with the Hawk Watch. And then, uh, simply enough, his contact is S-Benz, B-E-N-Z at scudicinstitute.org. Great. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. Uh, a pleasure to have you with us tonight. And a reminder to people to keep a lookout on our website and Facebook page for our, our October program. And with that, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. And it was nice to be able to share this all with everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good night.